Hello friends! Welcome to Teach Like a Boss with Dr. April DeBoard. I'm so excited to get started and hang out with you guys. So today we're going to talk about keeping your students awake. It's not hard sometimes. Engaged and connected. Today I'm going to share with you about my action research and how to teach like a boss by using three things. So first we're going to do some actions together. So it's going to be self. And it's going to be story, a scribble, scribble, scribble. And it's going to be structure. Whoop. Okay, so first we're going to do self. We're going to do story, scribble, scribble, scribble. And we're going to do structure. Whoop. Super excited to hang out with you. I hope that you're excited. Follow me at Blue DeBoard on Twitter and adeboard at jcpsmail.org. So pumped to get into it. This is my gifstery. I don't know if you've ever made a gifstery. I thought I made it up, but then I looked it up and it was a thing somebody else already made up. Have you ever done that? That's kind of awesome in our lives, right? These are things about me that I love because our first component is self. I wanted you to know a little bit about me and myself. And I think this is a fun way to be able to enjoy these moments. So um, when you are presenting to people or when you are teaching people, it's important for them to know who you are and it's important to take that time. So these are some things about me. I bet if you look at this screen, you can probably figure out a few things about me already. So up here at the top, blue, I love the color blue. Salt, salt is one of my favorite things in life. Uh, I've made a lot of strategic errors. Don't worry about my sodium, it's okay. I get it checked all the time, so it's fine. But I have made a lot of strategic errors in my life. I don't know if you have ever made an error. Probably not. But if you have, that's how we learn, right? That's what I love about learning language because I'm making mistakes all the time. But every time I make a mistake, sometimes they're embarrassing. Uh, but sometimes I grow from those. Because one, one time I was learning Spanish. I'm, I'm a Spanish teacher by trade. And I'm learning Spanish. And instead of saying misa, which is the word for mass, like a Catholic mass, I said masa, which is the word for dough not the same thing and it was a really hilarious context so i love learning languages i love uh, playing the guitar and singing and writing songs i love learning i've gone to way too many schools to count uh, but I, I love learning at each one of them i love unsweet tea now i did used to drink sweet tea but i do love uh drinking tea always a beverage in my hand if you ever see me and i also grew up with the name April. So of course I have to love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I love laughter. Mountains aren't just funny. They are hill areas. Okay guys. I live in the mountains. This is one of my favorite puns. I do uh, love education and travel. And uh, this is a picture from my friend's wedding I recently got to go to in Japan that we'll talk about a little bit later. So I want you to think about something that you are truly passionate about, something that you love doing, something that is something that makes up who you are. Our three S's, let's do that review again. Self, whoosh, story, scribble, 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 and structure whoop, are, are things that are going to kind of drive when we're teaching like a boss. These things are going to go throughout and kind of provide a framework for our presentation, for our lesson, for the thing that we're doing uh, so that people can be a part of what we are. The three things about self that we're going to talk about are how intelligent or creative are you, the formula for impossible, number two, and then three, the passion and fusion, the marvelous mundane, the art of the impossible, right? So how can we do something that's impossible uh, together? So one of my favorite... Um personalities on YouTube is Sir Ken Robinson. He passed away in 2020, but he has a lot of great things to share about education. He has uh, some fun thoughts. You don't have to agree with all the thoughts, but when I listen, uh, I just hear things that I can apply to my own life and I think offer to the lives of others that I'm teaching or presenting to. So I'm excited to share this next video uh, with you about creativity and intelligence. Adults think they're not creative, uh, but children do. That's true, isn't it? Broadly speaking. Um, 
In fact, I want to give you a quick test, if I could. How creative do you think you are, personally? Uh, where would you put yourself on a scale of one to 10? While you're thinking about that, uh, have a think about this. How intelligent are you on a scale of one to 10? How about 10? Any 10s? No? Nine? Thank you. Two at the back, thank you. Actually, you can go now, if you like. <laughs> We're just wasting your time, honestly. But, uh... <laughs> Eight, seven, six, five, four, three. It's getting tense, isn't it? Two. Any twos? OK. I never do one, by the way. If you've got one, you're not following this anyway, are you, to be honest? So... <laughs> um, one last question. Last time you have to put your hands up. Uh, put your hands up if you gave yourself different marks for intelligence or creativity. OK. Now, the reason I ask you this is, I mean, I think you're all wrong, by the way. Yeah, obviously, apart from the two nines, obviously, I mean, never argue with a nine, is my view. But, um, but the reason I say it is that I think most people operate on a very limited conception of creativity and of intelligence. So my question is, what were you thinking of when you gave yourself the mark? Uh, when you decided you could give a number for creativity, what was in your mind? Uh, when you gave yourself a number for intelligence, what was it you were thinking of? Um, you see, my experience of it is that people operate on all kinds of misconceptions about creativity. They think it's all about the arts. Well, the arts are terribly important, but it's not just about the arts. They think it's about special people. It's really not. I mean, if you're a human being, it comes with a kit. You know, you are born with tremendous creative capacities. Um, the trouble is that creativity is a bit like literacy. You may have an aptitude for it, but never develop the abilities that are required to exercise it. And that, to me, is a big fault of our education system. Um, and the third misconception is there's nothing you can do about it. You're creative or you're not, and that's the end of it. And I believe there's a great deal you can do to make yourselves more creative. There was a very good programme on the BBC. It was about how many people can live on Earth. And they came to this view. You know, there are now seven and a half billion people on the planet. And we don't know if the Earth can handle it. So they said if everybody on Earth were to consume at the same rate as the average person in Rwanda, you know, consume food, fuel, water, uh, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 15 billion people. Uh, so we're halfway to that. The trouble, of course, is we don't all consume at the same rate as they do in Rwanda. They said if everybody on Earth were to consume at the same rate as the average person in North America, the Earth could sustain a maximum population of 1.2 billion. So we're five times past that currently. Uh, so if everybody on Earth wanted to live as we do in North America, and by the way, they do, uh, we would need four more planets to make this feasible, uh, which we don't have. And there's a paradox here. All of these challenges are created by human ingenuity and human innovation and creativity. It's not the lemurs that are causing the problem, it's us. Uh, and at the very point where we need to get even more innovative, more inventive, more ingenious to deal with the challenges that we have created, our education systems are stifling the very capacities on which we're about to depend. I just want to get to this. We really live in two worlds, don't we? There's a world that exists whether or not you exist. A world that came into being before you did, it was here before you got here, it'll be here all being well after you've gone. It's the world of other people, events, other circumstances. Our education systems are pretty obsessed with that world. Um, but there's another world that exists only because you exist. It's the world of your own private consciousness, the world that came into being when you did. The world, as somebody once said, where there's only one set of footprints. A world of your private passions, your motivations, your aspirations, your hopes and your talents. And I believe the future of the world around us, as far as we're concerned, depends on understanding much more about the world within us. And the more standardized our education systems become, 
the less amenable they are to allowing us to make those explorations. You have no idea what your talents are, I'm sure. So what I'm saying is if we're serious about exploring the world around us, we have to explore the world within us. We are a very small part of all of this. The Earth has been around for four and a half billion years. Human beings like us showed up. I don't mean like Neanderthal creatures. I mean group of people like us, you know, with, a, you know, with attractive profiles and a sense of irony. You know, like we, we showed up at less, probably less than 100,000 years ago. We are despoiling the very planet on which we depend and we won't, I think, make a better job of it until we understand the depth of our own talent and spiritual resources within us. When I asked you how intelligent you are, it's the wrong question. The real question is how are you intelligent? The question is not how creative are you, it's how are you creative? And if we can flip our education to get to a better sense of human capacity, then I think we'll have a better chance of understanding and making sense of the world within us and the world around us. quote from H.G. Wells. He said, civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. Now, it may or may not be the case, but what we do know is that the great bridge between the two worlds that we live in is education. And I think we have to rebuild it so that we can build a bridge to the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>so one thing I love about that video is just the way that he reframes that question not how intelligent am I but how am I intelligent not how creative am I but how am I creative and just getting first of all myself to see that and then my students to see that is just a really fun thing as I'm teaching um, and I'm excited uh, to share those moments with you guys so what's something special or unique that you have to offer that nobody else has to offer think about that and if you were alive with me, I would ask you to share that in Canva Live. So I'm excited for you to maybe think about those things that your students have that they have to offer that give them a lens into something that you may not know um, or an experience that they've had in the past prior experience. You know, connecting it to those prior experiences that your student have had is so important and giving them new experiences to connect things to in the future. So this is a quote by Steve Kotler. He wrote a book called The Art of the Impossible. It says, Motivation, learning, creativity, and flow are the things that kind of drive this art of the impossible. And when we think about our teaching, that motivation, that thing that got us into teaching, that thing that got us into the game uh, per se, and then we started learning even more. You know, I learned even more about the subject that I was teaching when I started teaching it to students. And I'm like, oh, wow. I really have to think all the way around this to be able to explain it in a way that my students can grasp it or all of my students can grasp it. And then that creative part, that part that Sir Ken was talking about, it's how we're gonna steer our boat or our ship or our car, or bicycle, whatever you choose. And then that flow is when we get in the moment and then we're able to turbo boost the results beyond all rational standards. I'm sure you've all done something that once you got into it and you started adding who you were, it became a whole new amazing thing that it would have never been if you hadn't been a part of it. And he says, that is the real art of impossible. So these are the five things that he says are create this formula for impossible. Curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, and mastery. And that will help us get to the impossible. But I want to posit to you today that actually the real way to get to impossible is this. You. There's no impossibility making possible without you. You make impossible things happen every day. Your students make impossible things happen every day. And that, I think, is that whole part of self and who we are and adding that thing into what we do 
our passion, our moments of joy, our excitement for the world and life. Those are the things that are kind of driving how we teach and why we teach. So in summary of the self section, there are three things I'd like to point out. Be willing to go farther. Your audience can only go as far as you yourself are willing to go. If you put yourself out there, then they can also go with you. But if you never put yourself out there, they're never going to join you. Maybe one or two, but you have to be willing to put yourself out there. Confidence is super key. Whether you believe that somebody else would be better at what you're doing, it really doesn't matter because you're the one who's doing it. And if you're going to be a chicken, at least be a brave chicken. That's a quote from one of my friends named Ken. And it's just been one that sticks with me because sometimes I can be a chicken about stuff and then I'm like, oh, I got to take it out. I got to share it with people. And then the last one, you are the only you and there will never be another one of you in the whole entire world. And your students are privileged to have you and to have that moment with you to share. And you are privileged to have those students to share that with too. So thanks. This is the end of the first section on self. There is one more question I'd like you to think about as we move into the next section. So what is your favorite and least favorite idea or theme or lesson to teach? I'm excited to move into the next part about story so that we can talk about that. But I want you to kind of have this idea in the back of your brain. Like, what do you love teaching about? What is a thing that's maybe very difficult to teach about? And how can we apply the moments of self and story and later structure uh, to that uh, to help us be better at what we're doing? Thanks. So now it's time for my favorite part of the presentation. We're going to talk about story and how we can weave those things about ourselves into who we are along with digital tools to help us tell our stories. We're going to talk about audience, uh -huh, audience, the right kind of nodder. We're going to talk about the rule of three and we're going to talk about humor and how that plays a role in what we're doing. This is one of my favorite quotes uh, by Jonathan Haidt. The human mind is a story processor, not a logic processor. We all kind of know that inherently because we like to listen to stories. And when we have a teacher or a professor that tells us things um, in stories, they kind of stick with us and they stay with us. Um, even if it's not necessarily a traditional story, if you can relate it in some way to past and prior experiences, or maybe even create a new experience for students, then it's a kind of an exciting moment. Okay, so I love using Canva. When I teach, when I present these uh, tools, I didn't have to go find. These are just four random videos from Japan. Recently in January, I got to go to Japan, so I'm gonna use a little bit of storytelling to tell you about my moments here. But I found these four videos, and you wouldn't necessarily have to even have your own content that's the beautiful thing about using digital tools. You can even use PowerPoint. You know, people say PowerPoint is boring, but it doesn't have to be. You can weave yourself throughout it and you can weave your own um, content throughout it to make it interesting, even things you find. And you can talk about, hey, what's happening in this picture? What's happening here? These are all moments of things I got to see uh, when I was in Japan. Maybe I was there in January, so I didn't see these beautiful flowers. But I did get to take the Shinkansen bullet train uh, past Mount Fuji and see it in all its glory, which is amazing. I did get to go to Kyoto and see this person uh, like this dressed downtown. Amazing. And I got to see these people. I'm going to play this one again because it's crazy to me. And the people, just the sheer amount of people in a small space is something that a girl from the country like me just doesn't see a lot and, and just being in the middle of that is just kind of amazing. So showing your kids, showing your students, showing your colleagues what's happening by kind of drawing them in with pictures, with videos, that's what we want to do when we're teaching and give them that moment of that thing to connect to. This is my friend Saya and her now husband Yamachan. They got married uh, and it was a very exciting moment. And these are pictures from her reception coming up. She is in a second dress and they just do this huge reveal. Her friend Shoko and I got to hang out and this is her mom um, and dad on the right side. And uh, we got to go eat ricotta pancakes and amazing food together, which was actually very inexpensive. I got to have a very expensive meal um, by myself in Kyoto. Uh, I had Kobe beef. If you never had that, highly, highly recommend. 
this was one of my favorite experiences in Nara with my friend. We went to eat at this really fun little restaurant and we got to have karage, which is fried salmon or fried chicken it could be. And then we got to have sashimi. I don't know if you've ever had sashimi. I do love it, but I totally understand if you're not into raw fish. But it was so much fun and so exciting. And this is a, a bowl of rice I wanted to kind of end on and just tell you a hilarious story because in Japan, gohan, which is rice, is very important. But I had had so much food at that point, I could not finish my gohan. I was just like totally full to the point of like busting. So I ate, you know, maybe like a quarter of it. And as we're leaving, gohan is one of the words. I don't speak Japanese very much, but I know a few words. And so the lady was like asking my friend, why didn't she eat her rice? You know, these are like cute 70 year old lady and man who run this mom and pops restaurant. It's so tiny. And she was like, why did she not eat her rice? Did she not like it? And my friend was like, oh no, I'm so sorry. She just uh, was really full. So, you know, sumasen, excuse us. And thank you so much for the meal. It was a hilarious moment in Japan. And some, so much fun to share those kind of cultural experiences with your kids. Even if they aren't your own experiences. One of the funny things that the first time I went to Japan in 2014 that happened, happened. I can just share this picture. It's just a picture that draws people in and that's why I love digital tools because I can add in pictures, I can add in videos, and I can add my own stories to them to kind of give my kids uh, that experience of seeing. I don't know if you know about vending machines in Japan, but they're kind of impressive. Not just drinks, but you can buy lots of other things here. I was really thirsty walking around Kyoto one day and I stopped at a drink machine. I put in my yen in the bill form and then um, I received my drink. There are these two cute little girls walking by me, probably sixth, seventh graders walking by me. They see the whole process. I start walking, enjoying my beverage, and then I noticed that those girls had turned around and they were following me. And you know, I'm not really worried about sixth, seventh graders, but it is kind of weird. So I start walking a little bit faster and they start walking a little bit faster and I start walking a little bit faster, faster, and they also start walking faster, faster. And I was like, okay, this is kind of strange. But I get to a stoplight, and I have to stop. And they pantomime to me that they're, they were trying to hand me cash. And I was like, whoa, whoa, no, no, I don't, I don't need money. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. And then one of the girls was like, they didn't speak English, but it was hilarious. She pantomimed to me how I had put money in the machine and I had received my drink, but also I had received change. They followed me for two blocks, chased me down to give me back my money. And that's the beauty of the Japanese people. So when you're telling your stories, you're going to have things that people are able to resonate with. This is one of my favorite things. Uh, information combined with emotion creates memory. It's by Jim Quick. And when we think about that process, when we give people information and we give them a story, we give them an emotion to hang on to. You know, maybe you felt embarrassed for me when I forgot my money. And it's also kind of hilarious, right? Maybe you remember my Gohan experience. I should have eaten all my rice, but I just couldn't. So you give students something to connect it with that information that you're trying to provide them, how can they connect it with something that's going to give them an emotion so that they then have a memory of it? And, you know, it can be pleasant or it can be oh, cringe or it can be whatever you're trying to create at the moment in your story and in your teaching. This is one of my favorite things about simple stories. You know, get your character up a tree, throw rocks at your character, and then get him down. So that's the rule of three. It's very simple when you're storytelling. So I'd love for you to share an anecdote from your own life or one that you know. So one that you know that you can con connect with the things that you teach. In this next part, I'd like us to take six random words. I'm going to show you that you can connect pretty much anything in life. From six random words, I literally typed the most random words in English in a Google search, and I came up with these words. Zaftig, Floxinosini hillopilificator, akimbo, aglet, wrinkle, 
and agitprop. And these words have nothing to do with each other, but we're going to create some context with these words so you can see how you can do this with your own material. Okay, I know you don't know, probably, well, maybe you know a few of these words. I only was familiar with one of these words, and that's because of Phineas and Ferb. But here we go. All right, so we're going to create some context. I'm going to show you a few sentences, and you could maybe put these words, or maybe it'll give you some context for these words as we go. So before the lesson, I might give students this pretest with those words, and they can maybe kind of start thinking about those words. You don't have to do this, and try not to use Google during this part, because we're going to go over all the words. Don't worry, I am totally understand that tendency to be like, oh, what does that mean? I need to stop this. So. Uh, on this pretest, I kind of gave some context. Uh, they don't necessarily, I would give them like a bank of the words. So these words again, saftig, flux, nosni, hillopilificator, akimbo, aglet, wrinkle, agitprop. You know, we're kind of front loading those words. Might give them this if I wanted to kind of give them an idea for what's going to happen. I could do a fill in the blank. I could do a Google form. I could do any kind of thing to give them uh, a moment and a chance to connect with that vocabulary. So zaftig is our first word. I want you to put your hands all in front of you and laugh like a bowl full of jelly. <laughs> zaftig, let's do it one more time. <laughs> zaftig means pleasantly plump. It's usually for a female, but it can also, I think, apply to Santa Claus, right? So someone who's zaftig <laughs> is pleasantly plump. So whenever I say the word zaftig, I want you guys to do the action we're connecting with it. We could also make GIFs right now of us doing the actions. That's kind of really fun for students to do. I love bringing that technology piece of it in, creating a GIF um, library of us acting out those actions, even a video. And it's just really simple and fast to do that. You know, most students have a cell phone these days, or most students have a, a Chromebook where they can make a video of themselves doing those actions and share those with their friends or with you. This is one of the biggest words that we have, flox and nosini hillopilificator, in the English language is one of the most, the, the longest non-technical words. This word is made up of a lot of different words that mean nothing. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. So when we use flox and nosini hillopilificator, we're looking at something and we're viewing it like it has no value. So we're gonna go, Floxinosini hillopilificator. I understand it's very difficult to say. I would never be like, hey, say this word now. It took me a long time. Floxinosini hillopilificator. We're going to listen to a song where you're going to hear this word over and over again, kind of input that word. Have you heard that um, research says 26 times we really need to hear something we've never heard before in order to grasp that thing? Floxinosini hillopilificator. Now you've heard it like four times. And maybe still it's just like, whoa, she's expecting me to know that. So remember our action is Floxinosini hillopilificator. We're looking at something and it has no value to us. Floxinosini hillopilificator. I'm excited to show you this next video. Floxinosini hillopilification is what you do if you are the sort of chap who can't accept that anything popular might be any good and dismisses it out of hand as total crap. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing is what you really mean, but that's repetitive and a bore to say. When phloxinosine and vilification is a simple and most economical way. Oxynosinealification is great if you enjoy the chance to gripe. Grumpy folk have fun dismissing all that they dislike and can moan or mutter what a load of tripe. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing is what they really mean. But saying it thus sounds really quite absurd. With phloxin or senealification, you know you're never going to mince your words. Phloxin or senealification, 
we'll use it, or at least I think we might. If confronted by some clever thing we just don't understand, we'll declare the whole thing's just a heap of shite. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing is what we really mean. But saying it thus is not what people do. With flocks in or senilipilification, or I use several words when just the one will do. Flocks in or senilipilification is the longest English word in common use. And did this establishmentarians just feel torn apart when they hear it, and they may well hurl abuse. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing, but Mary Poppins fans truly hate it, and may offer a foul rebuke. The flocks in or senilipilification is a real word unlike supercalifragicobbledygook. Unlike supercalifragicobbledygook. When flocks in or senilipilification... So our next word, that was a pretty fun video, right? <laughs> that was a pretty funny video, right? And so he says, Floxinosini illipilification. And because he's from Britain. So we're going to say Floxinosini illipilificator. Okay, our next word is akimbo. So I want you to put your hands on your hip. It's kind of hard uh, in my video here. Put your hands on your hips and you're going to say, dun 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 dun. Yeah, that's right. Dun 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 dun. That's akimbo. When you put your hands on your hips and stand like that, you are standing akimbo. I learned that word when I was looking up these words. I had no idea what it means. Maybe some of you are aware of akimbo. Dun, 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 dun. Very nice. Great acting. I love it. Our next word is agitprop. So this is some agitprop from World War II and maybe some agitprop that we might have seen a few years ago uh, with Donald Trump and Hillary. So. Um, free speech doesn't mean careless talk. That's propaganda, right? And we also have some people that might be irritated by that. If you're a free speech person and you're just like, actually, free speech means free speech. And then also, uh, I'm counting on you, don't discuss troop movements, ship sailings, war equipment. So agitprop was made um, to agitate and it's propaganda. Agitprop. So uh, we also have this picture of Trump as an Oompa Loompa, which if you're a Trump supporter, probably makes you like, oh, that frustrates me. Hillary Monopoly probably also frustrates you if you're for both of those camps or maybe you're for neither. Um, so agitprop is something that agitates you and it's propaganda. So we're going to have something that makes us a little bit uncomfortable. We're going to go <sighs> agitprop. <sighs> it's something that kind of gets at you. Um, agit prop agitation propaganda together agit prop <sighs> so excited you guys are amazing aglet so for this one you're just going to stomp on the floor okay aglet because this is the little guy at the end of your shoelace that little plastic piece is called an aglet phineas and ferb taught me that and if you see that little thing the little plastic thing now you know it's called an aglet and you're going to stomp on the floor or hit your desk because I'm stomping on my floor and I don't think you can hear it. So. To wrinkle, to wrinkle, to wrinkle also means to make mad. So if somebody was like, that's my girlfriend. And then the person with that person says, our love wrinkles your boyfriend. So to wrinkle means to make someone mad. All right. So maybe you're aware of that word. I was not aware of the word to wrinkle, but I love it. No, I can use it a lot. So now we're going to review. Okay, so first you're going to put your hands out in front of you and blow out your cheeks. Uh, make a billy. And we're going to say zaftig. <laughs> zaftig. <laughs> Floxinosini, hello pillificator. We'll make a V and we'll say psh. Floxinosini, hello pillificator. Psh. Agitprop. <sighs> Agitprop. <laughs> Aglet. We're going to stomp our foot and then to rankle, shake our fist and make a mad face. <laughs> to rankle. <laughs> so great review. Let's do them one more time. Zaftig. Phloxanosani <laughs> hillopilificator. 
agitprop. <laughs> Aglet. To wrinkle. <sighs> Excited to get into a story with you guys. So now we're going to teach the lesson or read, a, read and listen to this book. I wrote this book for you guys. It's called Aglets Are Cool. So when I say a word, you're going to see it in white that we've learned. And I'd like you to do the action with it. Two rather unpopular and zafjig <laughs> kids, Joey and Levi, were standing akimbo. Dun, 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 dun one day on the street outside of their houses. Joey looks at Levi and says, Hey, have you ever thought about making really cool aglets? Levi, oh, <laughs> Levi standing akimbo, dun, 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 looks down at his aglets and says, Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Joey says, Levi, my zaftic friend, we could start our own business. Levi responds, Let's do it. The two kids start making aglets. They make sports aglets and aglets of bling, aglets of pom-poms and aglets of all colors. They become so successful, they even make a catalog to sell aglets to their classmates. Gwen is the biggest Phloxenosini hillopillificator at school. She also happens to be very mean. She always looks at everything as valueless. She loves to make posters, and this is her favorite. Mean Girls Rock, and you don't. She decides to make some agitprop <laughs> against aglets. She makes agitprop <laughs> that says aglets are for geeks. She also spreads rumors about the aglet business. Aglets are so lame. Gwen's words rankle <clears throat> Joey and Levi. We are so rankled. <clears throat> so then they decide to call the coolest guy in school, Young Sneezy. To combat the agitprop <clears throat> and phloxenosini hillopillification, psh, Gwen was spreading. They decide to call Young Sneezy. They ask him to promote aglets. He agrees to put a line about them in his next song. Young Sneezy says, Phloxenosini hillopillification is for haters and fools. Aglets are cool. Dudes and I pity the fool at your school who probably drools. We out. New York Times, Young Sneezy promotes Aglets are us. Aglets are us soars stock options. We love Aglets. Gwen's plans to sabotage Aglets Are Us fall through, and she starts a clothing company called Phloxenosini Hillopillificators Are Us. It's a very negative place to work. Your ideas are so worthless. Despite Gwen's agitprop, and with a little help from their newfound friend, Young Sneezy, Joey and Levi now have a thriving business a celebrity sponsor, and a lot of new friends, all by the age of 12. Aglets are cool. So that's the end of the story, at least. So hopefully you got a chance to connect with those words and to connect those words with a story that we just made up out of thin air. And that's the power of story. So now, when we think about those words, take a few seconds, you can pause the video here, and go through this pretest and kind of think about Ah, before the lesson, none of these questions made sense to me, but I bet if we did them now together, um, and you can pause right here, and I'm going to go over them in just a second, but I bet if you saw these, you'd be like, oh, I can totally see what fits in there. In Hairspray, Miss Turnblatt and Tracy Turnblatt are blank. They may be plump, but they're happy. So we only saw zaftig a few times in there, but that word is zaftig for this first one. Sarah is standing akimbo. Sarah likes standing this way because she has a place to rest her elbows. Scrooge McDuck is a phloxenosini hillopillificator. He always looks at everything like it has no value. Aglets are found at the end of your shoelaces. I bet you'll never forget that one because we heard that one a lot of times. I hate it when you do that. It makes me mad. I am rankled. 
many politicians use agitprop to attack the image of their opponent. So this is uh, our post-test, it says pre-test, but this is our post-test to kind of just help us see that actually we can apply those words now, even though those six words were just really new to us about um, 10 minutes ago. Now we know them and we kind of have something to connect them to in our story. Maybe we can't use them uh, fully yet, but we kind of have a feel for what we're looking for. So what are you curious about and how can you use technology to connect with your students in this way? I drew all of those on a sheet of paper, took a picture, and then added it in. That's all I did. It's very low-tech, two-tech, and then I was able to share that with uh, you, my students. Or if I was in the classroom, I would do the same thing. How can I create a tiny story where I get my character up a tree, I throw rocks at him, and then I have some resolve at the end. Um, and that's what uh, we did with this story. And it's silly and it's even stupid. And you may have to rap a little bit in the middle. You may have to do crazy stuff that you've never done before. But finding ways uh, for your students to connect with those things is really fun. So I'm just going to play a few seconds of this video. Um, it's spreading the joy of laughter on a train, and I hope you can see what I'm going with here. you enjoyed that one and it at least made you chuckle a little bit it was an experiment that they did where they just went on the train and the guy just starts laughing and then you see all the people around and how they react to him just laughing and I love that and when you're in your classroom if you can create those moments of joy even if people aren't necessarily with you in the moment they're going to come along with you because you've created that humor you've created that thing that people can connect with you've created that emotion that's going to move uh, students uh, further in your class. This is one of my favorites. I don't know if you caught it, but she caught the pigeon and then she takes it out of his mouth. It's pretty amazing. Like the, the She's eating this bread or she's giving this bread to the birds. The bird gets it, she grabs it, takes it out, and then she eats it. I, I laughed too. Maybe I didn't watch it a hundred times, but I did cry laugh. Uh, and it just cracks me up every time. So even if you don't think that you're a funny person or you don't have that sense of humor to share, you can always find something. So many GIFs online now that you can find to kind of insert humor even into things that are kind of dry, right? You can connect those things and you can be like, okay, how can I add at least just a moment of humor to connect with my students and give them a fun moment in the middle of my lesson? So when you're telling your story, when you're doing your lesson, we're going to call them stories. When you're doing your story, your lesson, you're going to add some moments of humor in there so that students can connect and then uh, they'll it's kind of fun because that, remember, when we add emotion into our information, then we're going to create those memories. So we're coming to the end of our story section. So we know these three things after we have seen all these, just to kind of summarize. People want to connect and stories help us draw parallels and they help us make connections with words. We get to be the ones to digest our information first, connect with it, and then reframe it for others to do the same. So as you tell your stories, you're going to digest your information, connect your stories in a way that's going to tell the story of your information. Remember, we have our six words that we just kind of plucked from random, and then we told this story about them to our audience so that they could learn those. Um, and then the last thing is to break the audience's expectation by infusing some humor, even if it's not your own humor, adding in funny things along the way to make those connections and make those emotions, make those memories complete. Our last part is the shortest part. Uh, it's called structure. We're going to talk about beginning, middle, and end maybe a 
formula for you if you've never thought about the structure of your stories of your lessons 10 80 10 and then connection and cohesion most things in life have a beginning middle and end except for bad presentations <laughs> hopefully you're not saying that right now at this moment and you're still enjoying yourself a little bit at least but when we tell stories when we have our lessons if uh, we do, they're going to have a beginning, they're going to have a middle, and they're going to have an end, unless they're horrible, and then you're just hoping that they're going to end. So if we think about balance, uh, we have kind of 10% of our lesson that we're taking and we're presenting the concepts of what we're doing. We're taking about 80% of that and we have to put in that meat and potatoes. We have to put in that content that people are, are going to grasp. And then in that last 10, we're going to review those things that uh, people have. This is a really good way to look at that balance. Um, obviously this picture, but this right here. In the first part, I tell them what I'm going to tell them. In the second part, well, I tell them. And in the third part, I tell them what I've told them. So as a review, you know, we've talked about self and we've talked about story and we've talked about structure and how we're going to kind of build those things out as we move forward. One thing that you can start doing um, as a person who presents things to people as a teacher who teaches like a boss is start curating your own content. This is a picture or a video I found on Canva, but it could just easy, as easily be something that I took myself and shared with you. And I could be like, oh, hey, I went to this art class and I saw this guy painting and um, share kind of that process with them. You know, talk about whatever you have. You have your own content. You have your own uh, joy. If you teach PE, you could take a picture of kids playing. You could take a picture of uh, just the amazing things that happen in your school every day and connect things like that and stories and people together. You might take a picture of a painting like this and just ask an open-ended question uh, related to your content. You know, I taught Spanish, so this is a picture of the Spanish Armada, but I can say, what does this picture say to you? You know, how would you relate what's happening in your life right now? We're going to get ready to start school, or you may already if you're in a year-round school. What does this say to you about the beginning of school? And if I just ask you that open-ended question and you were in Canva Live right now kind of sharing your thoughts or you turned to a partner and shared your thoughts, you shared out with a group what you thought, you would find so many amazing connections that people make. I asked this question to a group of people, a group of teachers once, and just the, the sheer amount of things that they connected with that I would have never connected helped me see and connect and make cohesive thoughts that I would have never ever had before. And you're going to find that once your students start sharing like that, it's going to be amazing. And this is just a simple digital tool that we can do. That Canva Live tool, they can do it. You can do Padlet. You can do so many ways for students to connect digitally if they feel comfortable. Uh, less comfortable talking out loud, then those are just beautiful routes for them to do. You can have them make a vlog. You can make um, a flip grid, you know, flip grid response to this and just fun ways for students to connect with that material that you're teaching. So now we've talked about our self, our story, scribble, 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 and our structure. I hope that these three S's have kind of given you a thoughts about how you want to teach like a boss. And when we teach like a boss and we own those things that we have, we are able to share those things with others. I love the fact that you wanted to learn more about the subject to kind of give yourself a feel for uh, what to do and how to connect. So in the next part, I'm going to share just a few tools that I would use uh, to create uh, the moments uh, that we have like this. So here are a few tools I've used to create this presentation and I've used in my teaching. So this is Canva and if you've not created your free education account, it's amazing. I'm going to show you this app section. You can do things like text to image, you can uh, do dynamic QR codes, you can connect it to your Google Drive, and there are just so many different apps you can enjoy and learn about uh, as you go. A lot of great, great things. If you go to education, you can see how other people are using it and you can see the free teacher resources. They have a lot of amazing things in here. If I had time, I would spend more time uh, talking about this. 
I'm also using Loom right now to record, and you can get a free education account if you sign up with your um, educator email uh, to share and um, allow students to comment on your post. So if I have this video, it's actually what I'm using to make this video right now. So I can share this link and it copies the link directly after I finish the video. And then I'm able to let people comment on it. As they watch the video, they can add in their own emoji reactions. And it's just kind of a fun place to be. It also creates a transcript if you need, if you have students who need a transcript for your videos. That's what I love about it. it has a lot of amazing things. It shows you who's engaged with it. So if you're like, hey, did you guys watch the video last night? And then you have like four views, you're like, we didn't, so let's watch the video together, right? So it gives you kind of a, some insights into who is watching and uh, you know how they're watching. So uh, probably you've used Flip, just a really great tool uh, for students to share video responses uh, to the things that you have for them. You know, just give them that voice. Um, and uh, I love Padlet. I know it's kind of an old thing, but I have a back channel chat for this presentation, Teach Like a Boss. Um, and it only lets you make five for free now, but you can always delete it and remake it. Uh, you can sign up with other emails as well. Brush Ninja is a really fun one. So I just created this quick present or quick thing about a role, right? And I click play and I just added some different faces. The really cool thing is you can slow it down for each one. You can add some extra time. So if I want to stay on the smile for a little bit of time, then it will stay there and it won't move. Um, and there are teacher resources here uh, that you can use. So if you go to resources and teachers, it can show you why and how. You can also uh, get some help about how to actually use the app. I know this is a very short uh, kind of tutorial, but I really want to just point out the tool for you. One thing I use in my teaching is uh, GIFs. So this is, you can upload a video file. It will change it into a GIF. You know, they have ads, so you have to be careful about that as well. Just don't click on anything outside of the normal thing. Upload your video and it'll let you uh, do a lot of things to your video if you would like. Remove unscreen is to remove a video background. So if you have a video, I have a green screen behind me, but you can just use a, a white wall uh, to make your video and you can remove that. Um, it actually does a really great job. Um, another one is remove BG. Uh, remove .bg. That's just for images, so we have unscreen if you want to remove it from a video, but remove.bg will help you remove that background if you don't have a tool already uh, to do that for you. So these are just some of the things that I thought about when I'm creating. I found all these fun things with faces, like, I'm like, how can I create that? So I can use um, Brush Ninja, maybe not to create a video, but I can add some fun faces in with an, a video editor even if it's just to a still image like this, just adding a face is kind of hilarious and fun. Um, these are some things I created for my Spanish class when I'm talking about uh, prepositions, and I just used that little image that they had in the program of this little alien from Among Us, right, to talk about uh, this song that I found on YouTube, and I just made it a thing of it so we can actually sing it together and do the actions. Again, this is the link brush.ninja uh, backslash teacher resources for that. Here are some other things I made with Brush Ninja when I first found, found out about it and I'm able to just uh, share just some fun things like this is from a song I wrote and then this is just the very first thing that I made, just very simple, moving along a background. But kind of create some motion in the things that you're doing and you can use them over and over again when you're a teacher because we teach similar things uh, usually each year. You can also make your own GIFs or stickers uh, using those programs I pointed out. So you would make your video, your video to animate a GIF converter, uh, this link up here. Convert your video to GIF, and then you try the GIF background remover at unscreen, and then you can get your students in on the fun to make those videos uh, for your class. Also, you can apply it because we have this word Vloxinos and I heal prolification, right? So I made this video here of myself doing the action and then I'm able to turn that into a GIF and then I take that GIF and remove the background here um, for this video. And then I made a Tortuga video and did the same uh, thing there. So just really fun and as you can see right here I didn't have my green screen 
propped up. I basically just made it on my background and it did a really good job of removing that background. You always have some uh, bleed through on that, but kind of exciting uh, moments uh, to be able to create your own content and share it with your students. And you can also get them in on the fun. Your students will have even more creative ideas. So let's review our three S's. Self, story, scribble, 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 and structure. Whoop. And let's talk about those in review of our three points for each one. Be willing to go farther. Your audience can only go as far as you are willing to go. So take it to the next level. You guys are amazing. Confidence is super key. Whether you believe someone else could do it, remember, it doesn't matter because you're the one who's doing it. And you are the only you. Next, when we talked about story, we talked about people wanting to connect. Stories help us draw parallels. We get to be the ones who digest our information first, connect with it, and then reframe it for others. Break down the audience's expectation by infusing some humor, even if it's not your own. And lastly, beginning, middle, and end. We want all of our presentations to have that, all of our lessons to have that, all of the things we share uh, with people. We want balance and we want frameworks like stories and anecdotes um, and curating our own resources to help us make connections and create cohesion. I want to end with this awesome video here. I think you'll enjoy it and I'm looking forward to meeting you one day in person. Thanks for watching my video and listening to my voice this whole time. You're the best and I hope you have an amazing summer and a great start to your school year. قدام المدرسة المديرة حتطرد الخصم مو وقت الحين يلا يا بابا الناس يلا مع السلامة مو وقت الحين قدام المدرسة امشي يا شيخة يلا مع السلامة I love that video and it makes me laugh every single time so I hope that you have enjoyed found some things that you can share. Maybe it was what you're thinking, maybe it wasn't, but I really appreciate you sticking with me this long and so excited uh, for you to be able to teach like a boss in this next coming year, um, in this upcoming year. And I am really uh, excited that we got to spend this time together. Thanks, friends.